These are tough times. Whether thinking about the ecological crisis or the pandemic, it can be a bit overwhelming. And I think I'm in, in need of a lot of therapy these days. But the best therapy there is for me is nature therapy. I'm walking along Glendalough Lake in Wicklow in Ireland and it is amazing. You can't help but feel well and content and relaxed here. The smell of the pines, the sound of the wind through the trees, the gentle lapping of the waves on the shore, the odd tweets from the birds here and there, and the softness of the pines underfoot. Totally immersed in nature here. And it is a nice breeze. So welcome to this session. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the Youth Climate Summit. And you've just heard one way I manage my anxiety, and that's to connect with nature. Nature has always been a, a source of therapy for me. And it seems that over the past eight months, more and more people are turning to nature to help them with their own well-being. So I think we need to garden our way through this Let's help ourselves and nature too. My name is Patrick Kerwin. I'm someone who cares deeply about the natural world. I'm a science teacher who's trying to teach people about the beauty of nature and its value. I'll be speaking to you about how we can use a school garden to connect our students with nature and also how to, you can run an environmental leadership development program through the garden. But let's take a moment to recognize first that we need nature and not just in terms of the supply of physical resources. When we spend time in nature, we enjoy it, but it's also good for our mental health and well-being. There are lots of articles and pieces of research that sing to this. Looking after our mental health and well-being is important for everyone, and there are things that each of us can do in our day-to-day -day lives that can help support good mental health. Connecting with nature is one of them. Scientists are continually researching how our natural environment affects our bodies and our minds. The reasons why spending time in nature is good for us, well, they're complex, and our understanding of this relationship is getting better all the time. Some evidence suggests that contact with nature can boost your mood, and it can help fend off depression by altering chemicals such as serotonin and dopamine in our brains. There's evidence that we have an innate need for nature, a concept known as biophilia, a primal urge to connect with the natural world around us. The benefits of interacting with nature are often related to how our senses connect us to the environment around us. It gives our mind and senses a much needed break. Walking in this forest in Wicklow in Ireland, I couldn't help but feel relaxed and well. The walk is really enchanting. Taking quiet time to reflect on our natural surroundings can be a positive experience. And there is evidence that forest bathing or forest therapy can lead to improved mental health. And this simply involves spending active time in a forest, observing our surroundings, using all of our senses. While walking in nature, you can practice mindfulness which has been found to reduce feelings of stress and increase feelings of self-compassion and empathy. And I think we all need that right now. Multiple studies have revealed the link between access to green space and reduced risk of mental health problems, improved mood, reduced stress and increased physical activity. Green space can mean access to fields, forests, parks and of course gardens and this is one of the reasons why every school should have a garden students who are suffering from exam stress or feel under pressure have a place to go and relax but now more than ever we need even more green spaces for those of us who are not lucky enough to have a garden well you can connect with nature by growing on your balcony or perhaps invest in some houseplants 
Houseplants help to keep me going through the winter days. I spend a couple of hours every week watering them and checking in on them. I enjoy watching new leaves unfurl, or when I wake in the morning, I see patterns of my monstera leaves on the ceiling, and it's really lovely. I also do a lot of propagating in winter, and it keeps me kind of ticking over, and some houseplants are very easy to propagate from cuttings, and they make really good presents too. Nature can be a great source of inspiration. It can help you to get creative. And this can be through painting, drawing, photography, or perhaps crafting something. And this is exactly what Emma Mitchell does. She uses nature for inspiration. She seeks small nature finds while walking, such as these little trinkets on the side here. And she states that our mind when we're walking enters a focused state called flow. That dials down our anxiety. And she says that with each discovery, she gets a burst of mood boosting dopamine in her brain. So collecting lovely things that fell off the trees, she feels can really help with all this. And you can follow Emma on Twitter at Silver Pebble if you want some more ideas about all of this. Human beings are a part of nature, but we see ourselves as something different. We've separated ourselves from the very thing that sustains us. Without nature, we just simply wouldn't exist. So where does our relationship with nature start? For many of us, our relationship with nature <clears throat> starts in our own back garden. This is our route into nature. And this is where we venture out as toddlers and have fun exploring the environment all around us, jumping into puddles, getting mucky, turning over rocks and logs, and picking up worms and lice. The next time you have the opportunity, look at a toddler in nature, be it in a garden or a forest or a field or by the sea. They don't have to be encouraged to engage with their surroundings. They are really captivated by the palette of colours, the textures, the smells and the sounds. Our environment, our natural environment, is so rich and it delights their senses and captures their imagination and it stimulates them to play and create stories and games. For those of us who were these toddlers enjoying the, light, the lights in the back garden, well, what happened to us? Why is it that we, when we grow old, we become detached from nature? Why is it that we've become afraid of the things that we used to be fascinated by? Bees, spiders, worms. I believe it's perhaps because these interactions with nature weren't fostered continually as we grew older. We didn't have the opportunities. Our initial interest in nature is like any other interest that isn't fostered or fed. It withers and it dies. Seeing ourselves as separate from nature is a learned behaviour. If adults are not enjoying nature and making time for the elements, then we learn this behaviour as children. And what takes over? TV, phones, social media, which can have entirely the opposite effect of nature. So some stats, for example, on average, children watch more than 17 hours of television a week. That's almost two and a half hours per day, every single day of the year. Children are also spending more than 20 hours a week online, mostly on social networking sites. And as the children grow older, their electronic addictions increase. So children age 11 to 15 years old spend half their waking lives in front of the screen, 7.5 hours a day. This is data based on children in the UK. So unfortunately, then there are some of us who haven't had the privilege to grow up in a house with a garden which means that getting to nature spaces and having that interaction with nature is even more difficult. And this is another reason why every school should have a garden, to ensure that all children have access to nature spaces and can learn about nature as part of their education. Our education system is tasked with giving us the knowledge and skills that will help us in the future. Teaching our young people about nature 
throughout primary and secondary schools should be a part of that education. Richard Liu coined the phrase nature deficit disorder, which describes the human costs of alienation from nature. Among them include diminished use of the senses, attention difficulties, and higher rates of physical and emotional illness. There are so many benefits for having a school garden. So let's take a look at Hammersmith Academy's school garden that I started about six years ago. School gardens can be amazing places and a hive of activity. And Hammersmith Academy's garden is certainly very, very, very special. David Attenborough's latest documentary, A Life in Our Planet, shows us what humans have done to nature. A life in our planet, it's at stake. In 83 years, the population on our planet has more than tripled. The amount of carbon in our atmosphere during this period has increased by 48% and the remaining wilderness has dropped by half. In 1937, there's 66% remaining wilderness and in 2020, that's 35%. We are experiencing the sixth mass extinction. We're destroying the natural world that supports us. WWF have published their Living Planet Report 2020. It's like a health check for our planet. In five decades, our planet's wildlife populations have plummeted by 68% in size. If that percentage related to our human population, it would mean that our planet's human population would have re reduced by 5.8%. 3 billion people. We have mobilised quite quickly to reduce the risk posed by coronavirus. We need to mobilise to protect nature. 68% is just an average. If we look at freshwater organisms, their population has declined by 84%, which isn't surprising, considering that 90% of the world's wetlands have been lost or destroyed, should I say, by people in the last three centuries. I'm nearly 40. In my lifetime, I have also seen changes in the natural world. When I was a child, I used to go driving in the countryside with my parents, visiting relatives. We might have spent maybe 40 minutes in the car on a round trip. By the time we got back home in the summer, our windscreen and fender of the car would be covered in dead insects. These are flying insects that would have collided with the car while we were driving. If I did that same drive now, at the same time in the summer, my windscreen would be completely free of insects. The windscreen of my car would be clean. 
insect populations have dropped dramatically. And these are my personal observations, but they've been seen elsewhere. In Germany, scientists collected and recorded the number of insects they found in 1994. A two litre beaker is nearly full. They use the same methods in the same area over the same time frame. And in 2016, 22 years later, they collected a fraction of what they collected in 1994, nearly an 80% drop. Scientists have looked at 63 German protected sites and have found there has been a 76% drop in insect biomass between 1989 and 2016. This is frightening. Why does it matter? Insects are crucial components of many ecosystems where they perform many functions, aerating the soil, pollination, controlling plant pests, recycling nutrients. They are a food source for many animals. These insects are part of a complex ecosystem that we have disrupted. More than 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. The rate of extinction is eight times faster than that of mammals, birds and reptiles. This is overwhelming. It's really hard to think about. The way I cope with the climate breakdown and ecological crisis is to take some action. Surrounding myself with nature, growing my own food, creating a wildlife friendly garden and sharing my experience as much as I possibly can. So now let's talk about what we can do. So I started a school garden in Hammersmith Academy about six years ago. Nature, as you can see, is a huge part of my life. I wanted to share my passion for nature with my students. And this was hugely important for me because I was working in an inner city London school with limited space. And over half of the students in the school don't have a garden at home. So by starting a garden in, in that school, it could provide a route into nature. And with that came benefits for mental health, well-being, and that was for staff as well as students. Positive social and vocational outcomes, environmental awareness, and lots of wonderful links in the community that provided rich opportunities for our students. I used the school garden to run an environmental leadership accredited qualification through SSAT. Students have to evidence their work towards meeting 10 competencies. Depending on what they do, they can achieve bronze, silver or gold. Now, this SSAT leadership qualification is open to primary and secondary schools, and it can be applied to anything in your school. For example, after schools clubs. I wrapped it around an environmental leadership program. So how does it work? Well, we provided a day's training on leadership with top ups throughout the year. We talked about what good leadership looks like. How do you run a 30 minute workshop? And we modeled how you do that, how you, to give good feedback. Basically, we were teaching the students how to teach. And it means they have to be organized. They have to communicate clearly. They have to engage a wide range of people and ensure, obviously, that everyone enjoys that session. We ran a whole school environmental program. It happened every day in all seasons. Our environmental leaders ran a variety of workshops and it happened during tutor time from 11.30 to 12. So a tutor group would come down to the garden and four or five students would be paired with the student leader who would share their knowledge on upcycling, propagation, animal care, food growing and lots more. There could be maybe between 25 and 35 students in the garden at any one point and it was all led by the students. Without the students, the program simply wouldn't be able to operate. The students got continually observed and were given feedback. They got observed by me and my colleague, the tutor who brought their tutees down, their peers on the team, and they also got feedback from the tutees themselves. They were assessed on punctuality, preparation. We had a rota so they knew what day they were doing and what they had to teach. They were assessed on communicating what the task was and how to do it, checking for quality control and providing feedback. Now, as the program progressed, we made changes to suit their needs. So, for example, we included a section on the observation sheet for safety, the ability to make conversation, a whole section on body language and a checklist for the observers themselves to make sure that they were doing really good quality observations. 
Now, much of the work that we were doing could be mapped and was mapped to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that's a really good framework for any activities that take place in your school. Now, when I asked the students, what have you personally enjoyed about the environmental leadership program? They talked about meeting new people, helping, developing their confidence, trying new activities. And this is interesting because they were new activities. It was new for them to be able to engage with nature. Normally, they don't get the chance to engage with nature. So this was something that the school was providing. They got a chance to reflect on themselves as leaders and to be able to talk to lots of different students in lots of different year groups. We also asked them how the program improved their skills and personal traits and characteristics. So the students talked about how they became better communicators. They became more positive, more confident. Now, a lot of students talk about confidence and independence and being able to take responsibility for something. They talked about that it was easier for them to learn. They're able to speak in front of bigger groups. They improved their socialization skills and became better orators or more articulate. Now, I gave the students a lot of statements in a survey, and these are just a few of them. And it basically helped us to assess the program. So you found the program gave you a better appreciation of nature. You became more conscious about the environment. You felt part of a community. You learned something new. It was good for your mental health and it helped you form relationships with others. Now they had to score how they felt about these statements. So one, they don't agree with the statements at all. Or 10, yes, they definitely do agree with the statements. The mode is the most frequently given score. And you can see the mode for all of these statements is 10. And this really speaks to the program and how valuable it is for them. So what's the impact of the program on the rest of the school? So when the students came down to the garden, well, how do they feel about it? So we did a whole school baseline survey with over 500 students. And that's before we rolled out the whole school nature program. We asked the students, how many of you would like more opportunities to garden? Only 20% of them wanted more opportunities to garden. Now, these were students who haven't had a gardening experience in school or in the previous year. Then when they came down to the garden for two or three days as part of the cycle, we evaluated their experience. And then that figure jumped to 60% of students wanting more opportunities to garden. So essentially what they were saying is that we really don't know what to think about gardening or nature because we haven't had the opportunity to engage with it. But when you give us the opportunity, then we want more. So we asked um, these kids that came down the same statements. Now at the baseline survey, um, so actually, sorry, the statements were you felt relaxed, you got to socialize with your peers, you felt part of the community, you would recommend it to friends, you got to do something practical. Now, at the baseline survey, again, with those students who hadn't had an experience of this in the previous year or gardening in the previous year, the most uh, frequently given score was one. But then after the baseline survey, when the students actually had that experience, the most frequently given score was 10. So the students are speaking really clearly about the nature related activities that we had on offer for them and how much they love them. So let's hear from the students themselves in Hammersmith Academy and how they felt about the programme. It's important to have a garden in your school because you can learn loads of new skills, meet new people. Personally, and I've benefited from my confidence levels increasing and um, yeah, meeting new people, making new friends from all range of groups. Secondary school should um, have gardens because it gives the pupils a sense of like responsibility to look after the plants and water them 
and also it relaxes them, it helps them out during... It's really time. important for schools to have gardening as it's a very calming and a very peaceful experience that can relieve stress from everyday school. Um, I think secondary schools should have a garden because nowadays in London lots of children don't have access to their own garden or patio or balcony and gardening is something relaxing and something a bit different. So this whole school nature programme was a long time in the making. It didn't happen overnight. It took us two to three years to turn it into a whole school nature programme. We had limited space around our school, so we had to be very creative. The students were involved every single step of the way. They did most of the work, like these gentlemen in the picture, who were preparing the site for chickens. We had to think about how we could incorporate this into the school day. After school clubs are great, but staff have work commitments and students uh, also have busy schedules. And if this is your only option for a nature related activity as an after school club, well, then that might exclude quite a number of students from joining in. So our solution was to incorporate a nature program into tutor time. Our garden opened up so many opportunities for us. We had a parent volunteer group the students grew food for Hammersmith and Fulham Food Bank. We built a relationship with the care home next door and ended up obtaining funding to get them a greenhouse for their garden and to make raised beds in their garden. Our students would go over on a weekly basis to help out. In the summer months, we'd have lots of students heading over for like a big, huge garden tidy. We worked with Hammersmith and Fulham Council on the rain gardens outside the school too. The students linked up with a local cafe and started an enterprise program selling their plants. They won lots of competitions over the years, which helped with funding and driving the project forward. And they forged really important links with community groups such as Hammersmith Community Gardens Association, which was a fantastic source of knowledge and support for us. On our journey, we have found that our school garden is a conduit to promote good mental health, confidence, leadership, environmental awareness and community. It created a wealth of opportunities in Hammersmith Academy and the programme there is still developing. Covid means that nature programmes like this are even more important. Now I have returned home to Ireland, um, so I came home in August and I'm currently working in Ard Skullnamara in the southeast of Ireland. So I'm starting from scratch <laughs> again. Perhaps I'm in the same position as some of you are. And not only am I starting from scratch, but I have a job in this wonderful school for just one year because I'm covering a, a teacher that is on maternity leave. So I won't be here next year. So I thought, well, what can I do in one year? So I set myself some targets. This year, along with other members of staff, we are going to try and make the school more biodiversity friendly. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to plant lots of lavender, maybe 150 plants. I have them on order. We're scraping back lots of stones here in the pictures, taking up weed proof membranes and planting spring bulbs for mental health and also wildflowers later on in the year. We've shown the students so far how to make paper pots and so wildfire seedings, seedlings, and we put bird feeders up around the school and we refill them every week. It's a start and like our gardening journey, in Hammersmith Academy, you never know where it's going to take you. How can we connect our schools in general with nature? So I would say go out for a walk. You might be able to collect some seed. Maybe you're lucky to have a garden. Collect your seed and allow it to dry. Store it in a paper envelope and share it. This time last year, I was in a local park and collected tons of seed and they were beautiful. They came in lots of different shapes and sizes. And if you don't have time to sow them all, perhaps you can take some time for mindfulness and draw them. Little patch progressed over the course of the summer. So it actually worked out really well. Every day I would see loads of people stop by on their daily walk to take photos 
of the cosmos and sunflowers. Lots of people commented on how much they loved this space. It really brightened their day and it was so easy to do and it cost nothing. So perhaps get thinking about your space for this year. The students in Hammersmith Academy talked at length about how working in the garden made them feel relaxed. It offered them some stress relief. Now down in the garden it didn't feel quite like school. So maybe plant some tulips this year for mental health. Spring bulb planting is really easy to do and it can have a huge impact. So find an area in your school and get planting and it can be done in November, December. The students dressed up a wall in our school with this lovely display by upcycling bean cans. They painted the bean cans from the kitchen and hung them from hooks in the wall. They also sowed the flowers from seed that you can see in the picture. And this is a lovely winter project. You can set up a wall now for a summer display and it's also an excuse to get outdoors because outdoors we actually learn differently. We see lots of improvements in cognition with greater knowledge and understanding but also we see effective impacts such as changes in attitudes, values, beliefs and changes in perceptions. Self-perceptions should I say. So one of the other things that we would do on a regular basis is deconstruct pallets. Now these pallets were used to transport paper to our school and they'd end up in a landfill site. So we upcycled them. We broke them apart with pallet breakers and then we had a group of students who would denail the pallets and then we turned them into planters. And we used them then for planting vegetables that we would give to the food bank. And working outside, the students had, you know, found that there is interpersonal and social impacts as well. So improvements in communication, teamwork and also leadership skills. Planting an edible uh, school ground is re really fun and very easy with lots of apple trees and fruit bushes. I'm also planning to do that in Ord Skull and Namora this year and in years to come, they'll get the fruits of our labour. You can do some apple juicing and buy a scratter and an apple press and it's fun for all ages. And having animals in your school, such as chickens, can be a great way to show students where their food comes from, but can also um, help students who might not necessarily be enticed to work with plants. And I've seen students who are having maybe a difficult time in class, working really well with the animals and taking a lead, showing others how to care for them. Bees are fantastic ambassadors for nature. Ali from Bees and Refugees installed three beehives in Hammersmith Academy and he ran sessions on ethical beekeeping and this has really engaged the students with ideas of sustainability and it inspired them to create social media pieces on why we should buy local raw honey as opposed to commercial honey and why we should stop using pesticides. So if you're in London do get in touch with Ali and start thinking about having bees in your school. It's an amazing eye-opening experience for all involved. Activity that you can do now and during the winter, you can make some paper pots. And you do this by cutting out two pieces, strips of paper from uh, an old newspaper. You overlap them. I was taught this by a good friend, a nice little technique. And once they're overlapped, you can fold them on top of each other, like this, and make a nice crease. And once you've done that, you can get something like a curry pot, or it could be a bottle. And you put this towards the rim that has been folded over and you roll it, keeping it relatively tight. Until you leave it a little flap at the end. So it's like this. You fold that back over it on itself. Like that. So it's like a triangle. And then you crease it like this. And then you can bring your, your curry pot down a bit, so you're making a little bit of room at the top here. Room so that you can fold the paper over on top of itself for the base. And you can shimmy this up a little bit more, and then you get another little like spice pot, and then you can press this onto the end, nice and hard, and you make a little bit of a depression here. Slide your curry pot out, and that's your little paper pot. Now, one thing that you could sew right now is some sweet pea seeds. So what I do first is I fill up my pot with soil. And once I've filled it up with soil, then I just compress it lightly. Don't compress it too hard because the roots will find it hard to go through the soil. 
but compress it a little bit and leave maybe a little bit of room at the top so when you're watering it, the water doesn't spill out over the edge. And then I collected sweet peas earlier on in the year and I make a little bit of a depression. So I'm burying it about twice the depth of the seed, pop it in here and then cover it over and give that a little bit of water. Now, when I'm burying a seed, if this is the soil, I don't make a big, huge hole for a tiny seed and drop the seed at the bottom. Because when that seed germinates and produces roots and shoots, the shoots won't be able to get above the soil to get sunlight energy so that it can grow. So I make sure that I'm only making a little bit of a depression for a small seed so that when it sprouts, or germinates, the leaves can get uh, above the soil to get their sunlight and photosynthesize. So usually the, the rule of thumb is to bury the seed about twice its own depth. Now, there's one other thing I want to show you. What I also do is not just start seeds off in these paper pots, is if I'm pricking some seedlings out of a container, I usually grow them on in paper pots and I find these are just really 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 useful and if they're if you do them well they're quite strong so I get my seedlings and I tease the seedlings up with the base of the spoon being careful not to damage the roots and I hold them by the seed leaves and then I make a little depression in here a little hole with the end of my spoon and I put my seedling into it very, very gently. And then I press down around it. And these are red campion wildflowers, which are gonna be fantastic in the spring. Give it a little bit of water. I, I keep these under a cold frame at the moment. And over the winter that will grow and the root system will become wonderful and developed in this little paper pot. And that can be buried deep into the soil or planted into the soil, should I say and then the roots will just come out the side of the pot. So it's, it's perfect. So the other thing I would say is that you can make these little paper pots over the um, winter and you can start chili seeds off in them in December. And that's a really nice activity that you could do as a whole school activity. So all the, the students in November can be making the paper pots and then in December you can start sowing your chilies just as I've sown those sweet pea seeds and then they can take them home and nurse a chili plant over the um, Christmas period. And hopefully later on in the growing season next year, you'll have uh, lots and lots of chilies to harvest. So my vision would be for a world where we have a deep value and respect for nature and where the protection of nature and our natural world is a top priority for us. I would like to see everyone making a commitment to get you and your friends, the students in your school or your family growing something. Learn and pass on some basic horticultural skills. Perhaps start growing some chilies like I showed you in the video or wildflowers, but make a start. It's really, really easy and it's lots of fun. A call for world leaders. Green up every school make nature a part of a whole school curriculum that is taught through a school garden do it for mental health do it for environmental awareness do it so the students that are going through the school system now do something that we haven't done which is to protect nature if you have any questions or would like any further information, please email me at pkgrowgardeners at gmail.com or you can catch me on Twitter or Instagram at growgardeners. It might take me a little while to get back to you, but I will eventually. Enjoy the rest of the Youth Climate Summit. I hope you found this useful.